Hi everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of analysis videos I'll be creating for Macbeth. These videos will provide in-depth analysis of key extracts from the play to help you prepare for producing detailed explorations of the text for English Literature Study at GCSE. In today's video, we're looking at the witches meeting from Act 1, Scene 1. I'll begin with a quick overview of the scene, followed by an introduction to the historical context surrounding witchcraft and the supernatural. All of the extracts I will cover in this series could be used in a GCSE exam, so having an in-depth understanding of this scene will provide you with a good starting point to build a confident knowledge of the play. In the opening scene of Macbeth, thunder and lightning sets a dark and mysterious mood for the arrival of the Weird Sisters, three witches who gather to discuss their next meeting with the noble warrior Macbeth. Their chanting conversation is filled with contradictions and confusion, and establishes the grim and unsettling expectation for the rest of Shakespeare's tragic, haunting play. Contextually, it's important to understand how witches and supernatural events were considered in the Jacobean era. That's the period of years when James I was King of England, during which Shakespeare wrote Macbeth. I've noted at the top here that this is an AO3 skill. This means assessment objective, and it is one of the marking targets for AQA GCC literature. AO3 assesses your ability to understand how context affects meaning in a text. Basically, how do the views and beliefs in Shakespeare's time impact our understanding of the play Macbeth? So now let's take a look at some of the key context that's relevant for our understanding of witchcraft in Macbeth. Most Jacobeans, irrespective of faith, were superstitious, so magic and witches were accepted as real. The previous monarch, Elizabeth I, passed the Witchcraft Act of 1563, which made it illegal to practice witchcraft on pain of death. The result of the act was between 500 and 1,000 deaths between the 16th and 18th century. Many of these were burned at the stake. King James I was very superstitious and even published a book called Demonology, which catalogued the spells and practices associated with witchcraft. Before he became King of England, he had blamed witches for a storm at sea which nearly shipwrecked his boat. He had personally overseen the trial by torture of around 70 people believed to have been involved. So what were witches believed to do? Well, lots of different things. They derived their powers from a pact with the devil. They could cast charms or spells which resulted in sickness, disease, crop failure, etc. They were believed to control the weather and summon storms, and they could foretell the future. And they were also believed to have familiars, which were animals that they could communicate with, traditionally cats or toads. It is also important to remember that James I was a patron, which is someone who offers financial support, of Shakespeare's acting company, The King's Men. And therefore, Shakespeare's prestige and future income probably relied quite heavily on having the king's continued support. It is therefore easy to see why Shakespeare chose to include witches, a subject James was fascinated by, in the play. It was his way of honouring and supporting the king. So now we have a good overview of the context surrounding witches and witchcraft. Let's have a look at the scene in detail. I have added another AO to the next slide, AO2, which is a marking skill which requires you to analyse how language or structure creates different meanings in a text. For the purposes of annotating, I'll be using yellow to indicate AO3 content, green for AO2 language, and blue for AO2 structure. Let's take a look at the opening stage directions. Thunder and lightning. Enter three witches. This use of pathetic fallacy here immediately sets the mood of the scene as dark and disturbing. Shakespeare is using a familiar trope in literature of storms to hint at the trouble and disruption that will come. Additionally, it also links contextually to the belief that witches could summon storms. So Shakespeare plays on the audience's expectations here and hints at the witches' evil intentions. Next, we have the opening lines of the play. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning or in rain? Where Shakespeare's use of rhyming couplets gives a rhythmic quality to the witches' language mimicking the sound of a chant or a spell. The second witch then responds, when the hurly-burly is done, when the battle's lost and won, which again relies on rhyming couplets, 
but also includes an oxymoron, a phrase which contains two opposing or contrasting ideas. The words lost and won are juxtaposed here and create a sense of confusion over the outcome of the battle, which again places the witches as characters who deal in half-truths and riddles, behaviour established here which will be repeated later in the play. Shakespeare then brings fate into the mix as the third witch utters, that will be ere the set of sun, ere meaning before, so before the sun sets, the final battle will be lost and won. The witches seem to know how and when the battle will end, indicating their ability to interpret or predict the future. Here, Shakespeare displays an awareness of the expectations of witchcraft in order to heighten the fear and tension of the scene. Following the decision to meet upon the heath, an open piece of grassland, the third witch reveals the hair to meet with Macbeth. So the first mention of the eponymous hero Macbeth is in the mysterious words of the witches. Shakespeare's choice to immediately associate his title character with darkness and devilry casts a shadow over our expectations of Macbeth before he even enters the stage. Structurally, Shakespeare foreshadows Macbeth's association with the witches here, as well as his treacherous actions later in the play. The next utterances can be quite confusing to first-time readers. I come, Grey Malkin, and Paddock calls rely on the t contextual knowledge that witches were believed to have familiars, which if you remember from the context slide, were animals or spirits they communicated with. The witches are called by their familiars, Grey Malkin, a cat, and Paddock, a toad. Shakespeare again goes to great length to mimic traditional beliefs about witches, perhaps as a means of complementing the king's deep fascination with demonology. Following the exclamation of Anon, which simply means soon. All three witches sing or chant the final couplet. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Which are certainly the most important lines in the short scene. Firstly, the use of sound is powerful in this couplet. Shakespeare uses alliteration with the repetition of the fricative F sound, which connotes aggression, mimicking a hissing sound associated with danger or pain. Furthermore, the fair is foul and foul is fair has a paradoxical or self-contradicting meaning. This absurd statement associates the witches with trouble and confusion, which again speaks of Shakespeare's desire to identify them as antagonistic characters whose desires are to confuse and corrupt. Through the combination of the rhyme, alliteration and paradoxical meanings in the language, it appears the witches are casting a dark and corrupting spell which will unfold over the ensuing events and result in Macbeth's tragic downfall. I hope you've enjoyed this analysis of the first scene of the play. If you found this short video useful, please support my channel by liking this video and of course clicking the link to subscribe for more illustrated literature content.